Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today, September 25th, 2021, for a, a wonderful AI Los Angeles Las Vegas section, uh, section meeting. Uh, we have a great speaker, very distinguished speaker. Uh, it's a very exciting topic in aerospace and uh, exploring the uh, uh, unknown world, and uh, it's fascinating. So uh, stay tuned. And, uh, but before that, we have you uh, logistic to go through. Okay, first of all, thanks uh, so much to AIWA headquarters. They provide this wonderful Zoom platform. It's amazing, very expensive. And, uh, and thanks to our speaker, uh, Dr. Lorenz. This event is uh, being recorded and it will be posted after the event. Um, if your Wi-Fi internet bandwidth is limited or not stable, you can try to just use the uh, internet for video, but you can dial in using the phone. Uh, this will give you the stability. The quality might not be as high, but it will be very stable. And please sign in the uh, Zoom using your real name. You can change your name. Uh, this way people can recognize it. Uh, and especially when at the end, you know, you have a uh, click your uh, raise hand to speak out your question or comment, uh, people will know your name. Um, you are welcome to type your question in Q&A box, but most of the question will be answered more toward the end uh, of the presentation during the Q&A session. Uh, you are welcome to network in the chat box. Uh, uh, our events, uh, events are all networking events. Okay. Uh, just a few words about AIWA. AIWA is uh, national and also kind of international as well. Uh, a nonprofit organization, 501c3, promoting aerospace membership. Uh, based uh, is um, merged from two distinguished organizations uh, formed in 1920s, one founded by the Wright brothers on aviation, the other one was founded by Robert Goddard uh, for a rocket tree. And uh, they merged in 1950, uh, 1960 to 62 in different chapter. And uh, currently our president is Mr. Basil Hassan. Our executive director is Mr. Daniel Dunbarger, who is a former NASA uh, executive. And our section chair, Dr. Jeffrey Michelle, is a fellow, is a uh, uh, Raytheon fellow. Uh, Raytheon, um, uh, I think they changed name, you know, uh, but it's a, a very good company. And the AIWA has uh, a lot of members are growing. As I mentioned, 90 plus years of aerospace membership, a great vision shaping the future of aerospace, headquarters headquarter in Western Virginia. Um, joining professional society give you the uh, a chance to net network uh, with different people, expert, and give you career advice, advancing your uh, business or career. And uh, your question, you know, you can meet. And, uh, you know, actually, there are many people you can only meet in the other way. You know, uh, for example, uh, astronaut Michael Collins, who passed away a few, year, uh, a few months ago. Uh, our session chair mentioned he, he was able to meet in person because of AIAA. Uh, it's just amazing. And uh, AIAA also published and was student paper conference, a regular uh, paper, uh, you know, it's highly welcome. It's good to put on your resume as well. And the different level of membership from professional, uh, young professional, which have, should have been called the early career, is upper university, uh, but below 35 years old. Uh, the membership is basically, is, you know, to keep you engaged and uh, give you uh, many benefits to help help people uh, advance in aerospace, encourage you. And we're running the special 50% off for the early career professional um, and uh, high school student is free, educated is free. It's a website resources. Uh, once you join AWA, you can immediately uh, join, engage and chat with uh, uh, members around the globe and uh, you know you can post your whatever you are doing and you know, people will respond and daily lunch has a lot of uh, insider stories some people even got business because of the, the information insider information aerospace america is a wonderful magazine uh, full of uh, a great report and articles it's wonderful it's free for the members and uh, you got great discount you know uh if, you know you save a lot uh, it, it, attending the national forum. Uh, that's a one another uh, great advantage. And it is what I said, you know, uh, AIWA, uh, sorry for the noise. Uh, the ARC published and AIWA Foundation 
It's mostly for education, and uh, we just received one million dollars from Blue Origin for Club of Future, along with some other organization. And the career center people are, you know, uh, this is a, a key for a lot of people, you know, career young and uh, experienced. Uh, the other way, one of the main feature is that people can advance in the level, in the ranks. So you can start from a member, senior member, associate fellow, uh, for example, Mr. Elon Musk, Mr. George Whiteside, and our former section chair from Boeing, Robert Friend, they are all associate fellow. And uh, fellow include, you know, people you know, uh, very famous people, and also uh, like, uh, you know, uh, those names here, they are great, you know, uh, contribution and leadership uh, in aerospace. Dr. Jeff Fischel, Dr. James Woods, and Mr. Steve Zakowitz is the president of Aerospace Corporation. And uh, all the others, you know, uh, you know, very. Dr. Dan Raymer is a very famous conceptual design uh, designer, and uh, textbook also. An honorary fellow, Queen Shadwell, uh, Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, and uh, Dr. Bill Kersmeyer, uh, and uh, many more. Okay, so you got awards, you get honorary, you know, nominated, and uh, you have this uh, Guggenheim. Then you have this uh, read award, so it's a very inspiring. That matching the goal of AIAA, and for students, you can be able to attend region paper conferences, and the design build and fly contest, and uh, uh, rocket launch. And uh, you you can apply the AIAA student uh, scholarship, and that require AIAA membership. And uh, we have events, national forum like ASEN, which pick up from leftover from the former flagship event of. Uh, space forum, space conference of AIAA. Uh, it's in November in Las Vegas. Uh, this, uh, look, uh, look, look, look forward to it. And other webinar and the regular events. And uh, these are the five major na national forums of AIAA. And local chapter, Southern California really blessed with, with exciting aerospace uh, activities and uh, heritage. So don't want to mention too much, you know, that just uh, SpaceX is right next to one block away, two blocks away from us. We have North of Roman, um, you know, Aerospace Corporation, JPL, uh, Virgin Orbit, Virgin Galactic, and uh, the new one, Relativity Space, Long Beach in our section, Long Trail Space, Morse 3D, you know, Honeywell, LJ Rocket Dine, and, uh, and uh, this uh, electric hybrid aircraft uh, company just right next door. And uh, we keep doing events so uh, people can network each, uh, together and know what's going on and they get inspired. Uh, so next week is uh, Dr. Marilyn Dittmar from Axiom Space talking about space, uh, space policy. And then we have um, electric, ele electronic warfare, that's very important, and the planetary defense international collaboration. And we also have the newsletter opportunities, you know, we have you know, cover page, cover story, and we did our best to, if you are you're highly welcome to participate, participate and let people know what you're doing or what you're interested. Photos, uh, articles, and uh, it's uh, just keep people, you know, thank you. Uh, this is a lady who's working on adaptive optics in the, uh, uh, in the Kirkland Air Force Base. That's uh, from Boeing. And uh, we have STEM outreach, and uh, we also post our event video if uh, permitted uh, on our YouTube channel and also podcast. So, you know, we really kind of blessed with a great uh, uh, people, aerospace expert in, 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 uh, in the country. And uh, today we have, you know, an amazing uh, scientist engineer uh, is a leader in aerospace, Dr. Rob Lorenz. He's the principal professional staff from Applied Physics Laboratory, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he's, uh, he worked he, he work as a near engineer for the European Space Agency on the design of Huygens Pro to Saturn's Moon Titan, and as a planetary scientist at the University of Arizona, and since 2006 at John, Johns Hopkins University of Applied Physics Lab, his activities have centered on Titan, Cassini-Huygens, and the future missions there. But his interests include Mars, dust devils, sand dunes, planetary atmospheres and the landscapes and aerospace systems. He is associated with NASA inside mission at Mars, the Perseverance rover, the Japanese Venus orbit Akatsuki, 
and uh, is the mission architect for Dragonfly, NASA's next New Frontiers mission, a rotorcraft lander for Titan. He is also Oracle author of nine books, including Lifting Titan's Veil, Spinning Flight, Exploring Planetary Climate, and the Space System Failures, as well as over 300 journal publications. Page, uh, pub publications. That's just amazing. It's our great pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Rob Lawrence. All right. Well, thank you, Ken. Uh, appreciate the uh, the introduction, and uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for muting. It looked like you had some some wind in the background. Uh, so, um, good afternoon, good morning. Um, I'm very happy to be speaking with you. Sorry not to be speaking with you uh, in in person. Um, hopefully that will will happen in due course. Um, so yeah, I'll talk about uh, Dragonfly and uh, Titan exploration. Um, you know, I have the, the sort of honor to, to speak about Dragonfly, which is you know, very exciting. Um, but of course, I'm really reporting on the work of, of what is now hundreds of people. Um, you know, Dragonfly is moving into implementation and uh, lots of uh, people across the country are making uh, great contributions uh, towards it. Um, some of you may be less familiar uh, with Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, APL, uh, sometimes confused with our, our West Coast cousins. Um, uh, APL um, uh, does a lot of work for uh, the government, for different branches of the government. It was actually set up for the, for the US Navy. Uh, and uh, one of the first products it developed was the, um, the radar proximity fuse for, uh, for artillery and, and anti-aircraft um, uh, artillery. Um, it got involved in space activities. We, we developed the uh, transit navigation satellites, which were a precursor to, to GPS. Um, more recently, in the in the sort of uh, NASA scientific domain, uh, we built uh, Messenger, which um, explored Mercury, uh, New Horizons, of course, which flew by uh, Pluto and Arrokoth, uh, and uh, part, most recently Parker Solar Probe, which is making the the closest ever approaches to uh, to the Sun. Uh, we're just getting ready to get uh, Dart out of the door. Um, that will perform a, an asteroid uh, redirect, a sort of planetary uh, defense uh, precursor. Um, I guess it, it launches uh, ne next year. Uh, and we're, of course, very, very busy with, uh, with Dragonfly. Um, so a little about me. Uh, Ken gave a, a great introduction. Uh, as, um, as you noted, I, I actually started out uh, as an aerospace uh, engineer, although if, if people ask, I guess these days I'd say I'm a, a planetary scientist. Uh, I, I published a, a sort of rumination on the, the whole science uh, engineering um, uh, differences uh, in, uh, in aerospace America a couple of years ago. It was called uh, uh, Engineers are Dogs, Scientists are Cats. Um, you know, we're both, we're both uh, technical disciplines, but perhaps with a, a different sort of outlook and a different um, uh, organizational setting. Uh, I was very fortunate that my first job uh, straight out of college was with the uh, European Space Agency uh, in the Netherlands and uh, building uh, the, and doing the original initial design of, uh, of Huygens. Um, uh, as I'll talk uh, in a little bit, I, I built some of the instrumentation for Huygens and then, uh, then came to the USA. Um, and got involved with uh, Cassini uh, radar planning, working with JPL there, um, Mars Polar Lander, which uh, unfortunately um, you know, was never never heard from again. Um, you know, the nature of this business is that you are involved in many projects that uh, that never see the light of day. Lots of proposals that that aren't selected um, for for a variety of reasons, and even some missions that um, that aren't aren't entirely successful. Um, but uh, thing I've, I've got luckier, let's say, in recent years. Um, and have the good fortune to be involved in several flight projects, as well as uh, Dragonfly in development and uh, Da Vinci, uh, the recently selected uh, discovery uh, probe for uh, for Venus. So um, a lot of great uh, great opportunities have come my way, um, and that's over a, a career which um, now spans one Titan year. Uh, Titan and Saturn uh, go around the Sun once uh, every um, 29 and a half Earth years. And that really sets the time scale uh, on which you can get to Titan. Basically, it takes a quarter of a year to get there. So, you know, I got into this business uh, in ESA back in 1990 when it was uh, northern uh, summer on Titan. Uh, Cassini was launched in 1997, and then it took uh, seven years to get to uh, um, Saturn and Titan. Cassini was designed to operate for four years. Um, 
and uh, and did so very successfully. We we had carefully husbanded the fuel uh, and managed the spacecraft uh, very very delicately, and it was able to to conduct a, a two year extended mission, uh, and then a, another extended mission for some seven years, another Titan season, all the way through to. Um, northern summer solstice in, in 2017. And now we're just getting to start the whole cycle all over again with, uh, with, with Dragonfly um, intended to launch in, in 2027 and actually arrive at uh, Titan at the same season uh, that, uh, that Huygens did, which is very useful because we can you know, exploit the, the in situ information from Huygens as, as ground truth about what the, what the atmosphere is like, what the winds are doing. So you can, you can map your, um, your sort of big life events like uh, you know, weddings and kids and all that uh, on, on the Titan, uh, Titan year. Basically, we get to go around, uh, you know, two, go around the block two or three times or a couple of times uh, in, in a career if we're, we're lucky. Um, if you are um, like me and like to write about uh, what you work on, um, you know, you can put your, your books uh, on, on such a, uh, a time base. Uh, my first book was about Titan back in 2002. And, um, you know, I've written about a, a range of engineering and planetary science topics. Um, my most recent book is a big, uh, big colorful a book full of Cassini pictures about what Titan is like and uh, really, really serves as a good introduction um, for, for further reading if you're um, uh, interested in learning more. So um, uh, just a little bit of background about, um, about Huygens and Cassini. Uh, some of you may know the way the European Space Agency works uh, is it's uh, you know, a group of, of member states and uh, you know, if you were a project manager and you were told, you know, build a probe that will explore Titan, and we've never been there before, um, in an ideal world, maybe you just have the Germans build the whole thing, and it'd be great; it'd work fine. Um, but there's a sort of institutional um, and, and frankly transparent um, pork barreling. Basically, the the member states uh, have to receive um, industrial contracts in the same proportions as the, uh, the member state contributions to the overall ESA budget. So, um, you know, about 25 or 30% of the project goes to France, the bigger contr contributor, and 20 or 25% to, to Germany. So they did some of the, um, you know, the, the, the bigger efforts, the um, integration and test, for example. Um, but you also have to find, you know, 2% for, for Denmark to do, to do something or, um, you know, Belgium. And so the, the contracts have to be sort of parsed out to the uh, the various industries, and that's um, you know really something of a, a jigsaw. You know what the reason uh, space exploration is expensive. I, I like to note is that um, you know not that you have this this hardware here. I mean the the hardware is um, you know um, very very carefully assembled uh, from from high uh, high quality parts and materials, but you know somebody had to figure out that this uh, heat shield, which is um, you know, protected by thermal protection tiles used in French ballistic missiles, uh, has to attach to this back back shell, which is a, um, you know, a part uh, made in in Spain, and the, all the bolt holes have to line up. The bolts have to be the right size, and the electrical connectors have to match up. And you have to figure out that um, that these parts are being held on, on this dolly, which is manufactured in Switzerland, and this dolly has to go through this door in this test facility, which is in Germany. And all this stuff has to be coordinated um, you know, up front in, in, in paper. This was back uh, when we were still using fax machines and um, you know, Microsoft Word hadn't established a sort of global hegemony. We we're all using different, uh, different word processes, but, but that coordination is really a big part of making space exploration a success. And, and it does, does cost money. Um, but all that coordination, and of course the coordination between uh, Europe and NASA, um, uh, was, uh, was successfully arranged and Cassini and Huygens were, were great successes. Um, uh, Huygens was uh, released uh, from the Cassini mothership uh, on um, uh, Christmas Day, Christmas Eve, depending which time zone you're in. Um, 2004, it coasted for three weeks with just, uh, just batteries uh, powering a clock, basically, uh, to wake it up when it, um, uh, just before it hit the atmosphere of Titan at um, uh, six kilometers a second. The heat shield performed admirably. The parachute was deployed by a pyrotechnic mortar at uh, Mach 1.5. Um, the chute inflated. We let, let the heat shield fall away and we started taking data. The, um, the descent to Titan surface took, um, took about two and a quarter hours. There's no seven minutes of terror. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, Titan's atmosphere is very thick, very extended. 
um, the surface pressure on Titan is about one and a half bar, uh, and the surface temperature is very cold, 94 Kelvin. And the combination of those two things with, with Titan's nitrogen atmosphere means the, the density of the air is four times larger than, than the air we're breathing right now. And Titan's gravity is about the same as the Earth's moon, uh, one, one seventh of the Earth. And so it's um, uh, terminal velocity of, of objects is, is quite low. Uh, and so the parachute descent takes some, some time. Um, these factors are also the factors that make it easy to fly on Titan. And of course, we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, I had the, the good fortune to, um, to build as part of my uh, PhD uh, research uh, an instrument on the, um, on the Huygens probe. It's a, a little thing called a penetrometer, basically the size of my finger, and it, it sticks out of the bottom of the, the probe. And when the probe uh, impacted the surface, and we'd, we'd no idea whether the probe would survive that event or not, um, this uh, device uh, generates a, a little signal that's proportional to the um, the uh, force applied to its tip. Actually, I have a spare spare model that I carry around on my uh, my, my keychain. Um, there is, um, you know, one of these made from the same uh, billet of titanium alloy, the same uh, slab of piezoelectric ceramic. Uh, there's one on, on the surface of Titan, I, I assume, uh, still, and there's uh, one in the London Science Museum. Uh, if you want to go and, uh, and have a look. Anyway, this um, this device uh, generates a force profile. Um, the, it's sampled at 10 kilohertz, so the 512 samples are over in 1 20th of a second. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the grains of, of sand, dry sand, lock together. And so you get this sort of exponentially rising um, uh, signal in, in dry sand. Wet clay behaves more like a, a plastic material or a, um, uh, a viscous liquid and has a more or less constant resistance. And then gravel has a spiky signature with the, um, uh, the size and spacing of the, the peaks um, relating to the, the particle size. Anyway, after um, spending three years designing, building, testing this and waiting uh, almost 10 years for it to get to uh, uh, Titan, um, it, it worked for the one twentieth of a second it was supposed to work, uh, somewhat to my, my surprise. There's, there's me in the middle um, at the European Space Operations Center in Darmstadt uh, in, in Germany. Um, and uh, we, were, uh, we got the data and we had to, had to make sense of it before, we, before we'd seen the pictures. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, in a great uh, tradition of science, the, uh, the data we got looked nothing like any of the tests we'd done on Earth before. Um, but broadly speaking, there was kind of a, a flat resistance. So it could have been wet sand, maybe packed snow, something like that. And then, then there's this spike at the beginning. And the spike, maybe it was, maybe it turned out to be one of these uh, cobbles. Um, uh, but it could have been a crust. Perhaps and and we even ventured, you know, could it be like creme brulee? You know, you've got a a, a hard brittle crust over a um, a softer material, and the um, the the media love that idea. Uh, media likes um, uh, food analogs, uh, very easy to communicate with the public. And the uh, the headline in in Nature magazine was Titan team gets just desserts with creme brulee surface. Um, so that was all, all, all jolly good fun. Um, but the picture uh, that the Huygens took after it landed uh, was, was really spectacular. I mean, we had no right to expect such a picture. The, um, the probe could have landed in some fluffy dust or the parachute could have draped itself on top of the camera. But we were lucky and we got this sort of knee high view and it showed rocks like almost every um, planetary landed mission. Um, but these rocks are, are rounded. They've been tumbled in a stream. Uh, and uh, the Huygens data you know, really, really showed us how uh, Titan has been shaped by processes that shape the Earth. I mean, different working materials, different conditions, you know, temperature, different rates, different wind speeds, different gravity, all that, but the same processes. And uh, in fact, this mosaic of uh, Titan surface taken by the, the probe as it descended on its parachute you know, shows this sort of bright highland. Um, this is about seven kilometers away probe landed in here in this darker terrain that we think is a, a lake bed or stream bed. Um, there are river channels uh, in, the, in the highland here um, that show it rains on Titan. Um, it's, it's liquid methane rain on Titan because it's, it's so, so cold. Um, but the, the process of cloud formation and droplet coalescence and, um, and rain generation is, is the same, albeit under different conditions. 
um, off in the distance, there are these two dark streaks. Uh, these are actually uh, sand dunes. And we'll, we'll come back to those. And Cassini continued to explore uh, Titan from, from orbit, from, from Saturn orbit. It made maybe a flyby roughly once a month um, and uh, about 125 in all. Uh, sometimes Cassini used uh, optical cameras, sometimes it used a radar, sometimes it made gas composition measurements, gravity measurements, all kinds of different techniques. Uh, this is a radar image about uh, 200 kilometers across and it shows a, a large impact structure a crater about 400 kilometers across called Minerva. And you know, there's not just a crater here, right? There are these dark streaks uh, and over here, these are sand dunes uh, and you can see some, uh, some river channels. So, so Titan is a complex place. There's a lot of uh, ongoing uh, geological activity um, that is uh, shaping the surface and in fact, uh, obliterating many of, the, um, uh, many, of the, many of the craters. Uh, we know from um, near infrared, uh, data from Cassini that the composition of the surface is, is rather diverse. Um, this uh, is sort of a false color map. Um, there is uh, this leading edge uh, region called Xanadu, uh, and the, the blue tint is, is sign a spectral signature that we associate perhaps with, uh, with water ice. Uh, there's that crater Menova uh, I mentioned um, earlier. Uh, here's another crater called Selk, which we'll come back to. And all this brown stuff actually is, we think, uh, organic, you know, carbon-bearing uh, sand dunes. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, different materials exposed at a Titan surface, and we really don't know the details of, of what, what they are. Um, so there were, we, we knew Titan was going to be interesting, and there were ideas even before Cassini arrived of how to explore it, um, many of which, um, you know, exploited the, uh, the dense atmosphere. Uh, one thing you can do at Titan that um, is, is much easier than, than other icy moons like, uh, like Europa or, or Ganymede, is uh, use the atmosphere to insert into orbit by, uh, by error breaking or, or even error capture. And uh, there was a 2003 NASA study on um, error capture systems, how you would exploit uh, the atmosphere to, to deliver a, a large, very capable orbiter into, into Titan orbit to, to give us that global view that the Cassini was only able to take little snapshots of. Um, a thick atmosphere uh, can, can let you fly in a number of ways, both uh, heavier than air and uh, lighter than air. Um, there was a lot of talk of airships in the late 90s that sort of um, sagged into um, thinking about Montgolfiers, hot air balloons. Um, you, you need um, electrical power at Titan to, to conduct scientific observations and transmit the data back. Um, and um, uh, so far from the sun, solar power is just not practical and uh, batteries are not practical for, for long-term use. And so the, the natural uh, and obvious um, technology is uh, radioisotope power, you know, the, like the MMRTG that powers uh, Curiosity and, uh, and Perseverance, or, or indeed the radioisotope generators that, that powered Cassini. And uh, these, these generators typically have conversion efficiencies of about 5%. So the 100 watts or so of electrical power associated with an MMRTG is accompanied by, by about two kilowatts of heat. And you could use that, that waste heat to, um, to maintain buoyancy in a, in a hot air balloon. Probably need a double wall to, to minimize the heat transfer. But this is um, a, a very effective way of, um, of exploring um, uh, large areas on Titan from a, a, a close distance of a few kilometers. Um, but of course, it's not very, very strongly controlled. Um, you're, you're at the mercy of, of what, where the winds take you. Um, we did a study for, for NASA here at, at APL with, uh, with, with JPL collaboration uh, on um, a flagship mission study uh, back in 2007 called uh, Titan Explorer. And you know, we, this was the first time that a, uh, a, a broad scientific team had been assembled, uh, appointed by NASA to consider, you know, after Cassini, what are the big questions we want to answer? Uh, what are the techniques we want to use? And, and Titan is such a scientifically rich place with uh, organic chemistry in its atmosphere, with a very diverse surface, with lots of interactions with the space environment, that, you, that there are really a whole suite of scientific questions that aren't all addressable by a single platform. You'd want a, a mission architecture that has several elements, uh, an orbiter to do the global survey, to study the space interactions and so on, um, a lander to, to do the surface chemistry, to understand what the surface material is made of, um, maybe take long-term weather data, maybe do seismology to understand the interior 
of Titan. And, and we sort of imagined a, a vaguely Mars Pathfinder-like uh, or Beagle 2-like uh, lander uh, shown here sort of unfolded after its airbags have, uh, have deflated, sitting among the sand dunes. Um, back in 2007, the largest area we knew uh, where we could land safely were, were the dune fields. Uh, and there would be a, a hot air balloon as part of this architecture too, to, to bridge the scales between orbital and, and landed measurements. Um, then in the late, uh, late 2000s, we actually got a bit distracted uh, when we uh, explored Titan's uh, northern polar regions. Uh, it turns out the north polar region has, um, has substantial seas uh, and many, many lakes uh, filled with uh, liquid methane. Um, the, there are three seas, uh, Punga Mare up here, Ligia Mare uh, is about 400 kilometers across, and this uh, sprawling sea, uh, Kraken Mare, is about uh, 1,000 uh, kilometers, sort of tip to tip. Um, and we know from Cassini data, we were actually able to send a radar signal uh, through um, uh, the, the liquid here and get a, we got a bottom echo. So we know that the, uh, the depth here across Ligia is about 160 meters. So if you take this aerial extent and uh, make, make reasonable assumptions about the depth based on that measurement, you find that Titan has, you know, seas of liquid, liquefied natural gas, basically, that are, um, you know, between 100 and 1,000 times in volume more than all the uh, proven uh, petrochemical reserves on Earth. Uh, there's no oxygen on Titan to burn the stuff in, so it's not terribly useful. Um, but it certainly caught the attention of um, uh, of science fiction authors like Arthur C. Clarke that uh, the Titan is uh, potentially a great refueling stop uh, in the outer solar system. There's a lot of hydrogen-rich material like methane um, readily available, um, and there were ideas about exploring these seas. Right, um, there are there are tides. Um, uh, created in the seas by, by Saturn's gravity. Uh, we believe that um, uh, during summer, the winds are strong enough to, to form waves on the surface of the seas. And, and there are many shoreline features that are, of course are, are very similar to those we, we know on Earth. So there was um, actually a discovery uh, mission proposal um, led by Ellen Stofan, um, who's now the um, executive secretary of the um, uh, Smithsonian Institution. Uh, and this was work with APL and, uh, and Lockheed Martin to, to send a capsule to float in uh, Ligia Mare to, to drift across it with the, uh, with the winds and the tides and measure the depth with a sonar, measure the composition and so on. Uh, would have been a very, very exciting mission, um, but it was um, in fact not selected. Uh, InSight instead was uh, selected to go to Mars. Um, there were ideas about uh, aeroplanes that, that might um, you know, never actually land. They would just fly with a radioisotope power source, um, just continually like a, like a surveillance drone uh, to, to make, um, make surface imaging. But what, what really changed um, uh, was uh, in 2016 when NASA uh, solicited uh, mission proposals for um, uh, ocean worlds, um, including Enceladus uh, and Titan, uh, as part of its New Frontiers program. The, the New Frontiers program are competed missions uh, like Discovery, but with a, a bigger budget envelope, uh, sort of um, $850 million PI managed cost cap. Um, and specifically, they solicited Ocean Worlds um, uh, missions that, that would um, address astrobiological science objectives. And Titan is a very, very interesting uh, object um, in that respect because of its rich chemistry. The, uh, the methane in Titan's atmosphere, and methane basically behaves like water does on Earth, right? It's, it's the compound that, that forms clouds and rain uh, and, and rivers and so on. But um, in the stratosphere, uh, like water vapor in, in Earth's stratosphere, uh, solar ultraviolet light breaks it down. And the, um, the, the molecular fragments recombine in all kinds of ways to make a whole range of um, uh, nitriles and hyd hydrocarbons um, that are what make the, uh, the atmosphere optically opaque, um, make it hazy. Uh, and this stuff drizzles down onto the ground and by itself is something of a, a dead end because Titan's atmosphere is so cold, there are no oxygen compounds present in, in substantial abundance. But if you, if you make this stuff out of methane and nitrogen in the lab, uh, by the processes we think it forms on Titan, and then add water, then you can make very quickly uh, uh, pyrimidine bases uh, like cytosine, uh, the, these bases are what co encode information in DNA. Uh, you can make amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. 
And so in locations where there have been transient exposure uh, of the organics to liquid water, there may be some very, very interesting um, chemical building blocks. And we don't know, uh, you know when this happened on Earth back at, you know, four and a half billion years ago, um, how you get from these building blocks to the functions that, that execute the processes of living things. You know, how do you store information? How do you replicate it? Uh, how do you generate energy from metabolism? You know, there's this, this sort of then a miracle occurs bit. And we think a lot of these uh, early steps are frozen into um, Titan's surface, into Titan's icy surfaces, uh, and may give us clues as to how um, you know, generic throughout the universe the emergence of living things might be. So uh, Titan is, is, a, is a great um, uh, sort of prebiotic chemistry lab that, um, that has products waiting for us to, to go and, and uh, understand them. These processes may take thousands of years, much, much longer than you can do a laboratory experiment or, or get a grant to, uh, to, to work on them. So that's the scientific motivation. And the, the technical opportunity uh, is that, um, you know, while hot air balloons are great for, uh, you know, champagne breakfasts on your uh, wedding anniversary, uh, you know, if you know the weather is great, you know, if you want to go to a given place at a time of your choosing, you know, if you're uh, delivering some special forces troop for a mili military operations, or, or you're uh, rescuing somebody from a heaving ship at, at, in a storm at sea, you use a helicopter. Uh, helicopters are, uh, in fact, very effective vehicles in the Titan environment because of the dense atmosphere uh, and the low gravity, um, uh, such that uh, a given vehicle, you know, given mass and rotor diameter would need about 40 times less power to hover uh, on Titan than it, than it would on Earth. Um, and in fact, I, I proposed uh, this, this very idea um, back in 2000, um, but then it was kind of fantasy, right? There were very few uh, robotic uh, aircraft at the time, um, the, the autopilot technology, the sensors technology, the electrical motor speed controllers were, were not as advanced, the, the batteries were not as, va as advanced, uh, and in fact the, um, the radioisotope power systems that can operate in a planetary atmosphere like the, the MMRTG had not, not been developed. Um, so the idea sort of, uh, you know, just, just sat there and was um, sort of somewhat ignored for, for a, a couple of decades, but, but now when the um, uh, the New Frontiers opportunity came along and the idea of a, a multi-copter was advanced. You know, now it didn't seem so crazy, right? You can buy a little little quadcopter in any airport uh, gadget store. Uh, we've, we've seen the drone revolution that addresses, um, you know, the necessary technologies, some of which, um, you know, have been developed also for uh, rocket-powered vehicles like, um, like uh, moon landers. Um, and so now it doesn't seem so crazy anymore. And in fact, uh, uh, heavier than air, um, uh, rotorcraft vehicle uh, it was seen to, to make a lot of sense. Uh, the, other, the other part of this, of course, is the, the power source. And uh, I should note that, um, formally speaking, um, the use of radioisotope power systems on, on Dragonfly uh, is not a given. It is subject to approval per the um, National Environmental Policy Act. And there's a whole set of um, uh, approvals and justifications um, that, that uh, NASA goes through to, to ensure that. Um, but practically speaking, uh, the MMRTG is, uh, you know, the, the obvious uh, power source to use for a mission like Dragonfly and, and is operating very successfully uh, on, on Mars on, on two rovers. Um, in fact, the, the last uh, plane trip I made before the pandemic uh, clipped my wings was actually to the uh, Idaho National Labs, where um, I got to make some, some Dragonfly measurements uh, on the, um, uh, the Perseverance MMRTG. Uh, between the time when it was fueled with uh, the plutonium um, uh, heat source and when it was shipped to the uh, to the Cape for for launch on Perseverance, um, we wanted to measure how um, how the device uh, influenced the uh, environment around it, um, in particular the uh, the electrical conductivity of the air. So that was kind of a really really fun and interesting uh, uh, visit. But uh, the the heat from a, a radioisotope power system and the electrical power. Are, are essential for, um, for the Titan environment, which is, which is very cold. So the idea, and this was what was laid out in, in my, my paper in, in 2000, is that um, even in the Titan environment, the, the 100 watts or so that, that comes out of a radioisotope power source is not enough to fly, um, not for a you know, several hundred kilogram vehicle. Um, but the, the uh, Titan day-night cycle is, is quite slow. 
um, Titan is uh, tidally locked to Saturn, you know, like our moon is to, to us. So it presents the same face to Saturn as it goes around. Um, and that, that orbit takes, um, takes 16 Earth days. So at a low latitude site on Titan, for eight days at a time, you are out of Earth view. And if there's no relay orbiter, you can't communicate. Uh, and it's dark. So you basically just sit there. And that 100 watts that's coming out of the radioisotope power source can just go into a big battery. And you know, if you do the math, you know, the um, eight days is 192 hours, call it 200 hours, 100 watts, that's, that's 20 kilowatt hours of energy that goes into a battery. And that, that, that sort of energy um, lets you fly for, let's say, half an hour uh, and, um, and, and do so very, uh, very effectively. So what we do is we charge up the battery during the Titan night. Uh, we'll, we'll communicate with Dragonfly, um, see what the weather conditions are, download the data that were acquired overnight, uh, and then we'll fly and maybe use half of the battery capacity to, to do that flight. Um, and then get in touch with the Earth again, uh, uh, radio some data back, um, recharge a little bit over the next um, uh, 16 or 24 hours, uh, downlink some more data. Uh, you know, typically uh, we'll have one DSN pass per day. And so maybe uh, five or, or six during the Titan daytime. Uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll basically go to sleep, hibernate uh, for uh, the eight, hour, eight days again and, and recharge. Um, so this concept um, works very, very well for, um, for Titan. Uh, it, um, it actually is quite comfortable from a, an operations perspective. You don't have people having to work on, on Mars time and get, get jet lagged by the, you know, the 24.7 uh, hours um, uh, time scale. Uh, we can basically be on, on regular uh, office hours, you know, one week on, one week off, basically, um, uh, to, to plan operations. So um, that, that's, uh, that, that's the, the sort of operations cadence that, that sets the stage for, for how we'll, we'll um, uh, function on, on Titan. The vehicle itself, I mean, nothing, nothing like this had ever been contemplated before. Um, you know, there's no blueprint really to work from uh, for uh, um, a radioisotope powered exploration vehicle uh, for the outer solar system. Um, we, um, we quickly realized that a, a, a quadcopter layout is the most efficient way of packaging rotors inside a, a heat shield, inside a, the aeroshell that um, we have to be inside for the hypersonic delivery um, through, through Titan's atmosphere down to the surface. Um, we actually are a dual quad or a, an X8, if you, if you prefer, uh, octocopter with uh, two rotors at each corner, um, contra-rotating. Um, and uh, that actually gives us some resilience. You know, if we lose a rotor or even, even a couple, if they're not on the same corner, uh, we, can, we can still fly. Uh, so it's a, it's a big quadcopter, basically the size of the Mars rover or a, 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 a mini, uh, you know, small, small car. Um, but we pick the whole vehicle up. Actually, the, these rotor blades are about 1.2 um, meters long. He's the principal investigator uh, of Dragonfly Elizabeth Turtle. Uh, at, uh, at APL with uh, it's a, a aluminum uh, uh, mock-up uh, rotor for, for scale. Um, the, these are the same diameter as the ones on, on Ingenuity actually, but, um, but we, we pick the whole you know, three quarter ton vehicle up and, uh, and, and fly it, not just a, um, a small, small demonstrator. Um, we uh, do not have a relay orbiter like, uh, like uh, Mars missions do. So we have to send the, the data directly back to Earth. And for that, we need a, a high gain antenna. This is uh, actually a flat circular antenna about, um, about one meter in diameter. It's a radial linear slot array. Um, we have a similar antenna uh, on, on DART. Um, we're, we're building one, I think, for, um, uh, for uh, Europa Clipper, um, or at least it's been considered for the Europa Lander. Um, the, we use the gimbal to point that at the Earth to send data back at a couple of kilobits a second. Um, we also use that same gimbal to point um, some stereo cameras around to build panoramas of our, our landing site. Um, the uh, power source is at, at the rear here. We have forward cameras, downward cameras, uh, and uh, actually a zoom camera. Um, and we acquire samples uh, from the surface uh, for chemical analysis using a, a drill and a pneumatic uh, uh, transport system that I'll, I'll come back to. But 
you know, you've probably seen the cartoons of how an airplane or a satellite or any other vehicle looks to, to different engineering disciplines. You know, the propulsion people put a big engine on and the, the structures people, it looks like a big set of girders. Um, and you've, you've got the, those sort of aerodynamic streamlining urges uh, of um, the, the aeronautical engineers um, constrained by the, the diameter of the heat shield. So we have this sort of somewhat blunt nose that actually the, the latest design is actually streamlining a little bit better. Um, and you've got this big dish. So we fold the, the dish down for, 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 um, for powered flight. Um, another uh, interesting uh, novel design tension is, is with the drills and uh, uh, Honeybee Robotics in, in Pasadena are providing the, the drill system. For a, a drill, you want a lot of weight on the, on the, on the bit to, to, to make it um, operate um, effectively. And that's, of course, exactly anathema to, to aeronautical design, where you want to make things light. So we have a, a whole different range of design interactions on a vehicle like Dragonfly that are absolutely fascinating to, to see in, in operation. Um, we're in a very cold environment, of course, and so we, we use um, uh, uh, pumps to, to bring, the, um, bring the heat from the uh, RTG inside the, the vehicle. But we actually exploit the, the low temperature for one of our instruments. Um, we use a gamma ray spectrometer to uh, measure the elemental composition of the, the, the ground near the lander, in basically in a volume, uh, a meter or so uh, in radius. And uh, the uh, high purity germanium detectors for, for these kinds of gamma ray spectrometers. And we actually just shipped um, uh, a GRS for the, uh, for the Psyche mission uh, out to JPL um, last week, I think. Um, it's normal to uh, keep these detectors cold to get good signal to noise. And so the instruments are usually equipped with mechanical cryocoolers to, to refrigerate the detector down to, to 90K or so. Uh, but on Titan, we don't need a cryocooler. We just hang, hang the thing outside and let the, uh, the Titan environment uh, keep, the, um, keep the detector nice and cold. So there's uh, some areas where the, where the uh, environment is, is very useful for us. Um, Dragonfly was you know, proposed uh, in, in 2017. It was selected uh, two years later by, by NASA um, and is um, you know, now in, in development. Uh, what will happen is that um, you know, we fly to Titan and I'll come back to, to how we do that. Uh, like Huygens, we enter uh, or the Mars rovers, we uh, enter in a, 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 an entry shell, uh, deploy a parachute. Uh, it will still take us more than, more than an hour to descend by parachute to, um, to the, the near surface environment. We'll separate from the back shell, uh, a bit like the, the, the sky crane, the, the descent stage on, on uh, Curiosity and Perseverance, um, at about one kilometer altitude. And then we'll fly down to the ground under rotor power uh, using our own guidance system and soft land with the rotors. You know, it turns out once you figure all the bits and pieces you need to land once safely on Titan, you don't really need to add any hardware to just take off and do it all over again. Uh, and that's, that's the plan. We'll, we'll make um, you know, roughly half hour flights, uh, perhaps once every two Titan days, so roughly once a month to, uh, to explore. Uh, and you can um, see some great animations and there's papers and lots of other resources at our, uh, our website, which is uh, easy, easy to find with a uh, search engine. So those of you who work on, on aircraft will, will recognize the, the typical sort of power curve that uh, actually hover is um, not uh, the um, uh, least um, power uh, demanding um, uh, mode of flight uh, that you, by, by ramming air through the rotor disc, uh, you actually uh, gain some, some efficiencies in the induced power. Um, and so that like, uh, like terrestrial helicopters or, or aircraft, there's a, uh, a maximum endurance speed where the, the power is minimized. Uh, and these actual numbers have, have, have gone up um, since the, uh, the, the original proposal, but the, the shape of the curve is, is representative. Um, and there's a, a higher speed, uh, which is associated with the, the tangent from the origin here uh, of um, maximum range, you know, where the, um, the energy per, per distance traveled is minimized. And, and these two speeds are actually relatively close together for, for Dragonfly, for Titan, at about 10 meters per second. So, you know, you can imagine in, in, um, uh, in half an hour, uh, we can fly about 20 kilometers. Um, the sort of uh, uh, 
um, mantra we had in the early proposal, um, if though it was never actually a formal requirement, was, you know, in principle, this thing should be able to fly further in one hour than any Mars rover has ever driven. Um, I think in, in practice, we won't nearly fly that far. We won't want to fly that far, um, just because we, you, you only want to kind of fly um, as far as you can reconnoiter uh, in advance. Um, this this uh, is, is still a lot of power for uh, a spacecraft. And actually, we, we need a 100 volt bus just to keep the, uh, the mass of copper for the wires to go out to the rotors to deliver the, um, the flight power um, you know, down to a manageable level. Um, the, um, the, the general approach we'll, we'll use, of course, the, you know, the first uh, landing is, is done more or less blind. Uh, the vehicle will, will do its own hazard avoidance with a, a LIDAR system um, and uh, you know, basically land to the first safe spot it, it, it sees. Um, but after that, we can take off and scout out prospective new areas uh, and come back to, to land where we took off from. Um, and then once we've got a candidate uh, landing site next, and you know all this can be done by scientists on the ground. You know the uh, the, um, the only autonomy needed is for the vehicle basically to fly to a set of um, uh, landing site relative waypoints. You know, fly two kilometers north uh, and and come back. You know, th that's the sort of level of uh, of navigation autonomy um, short of the, the the hazard avoidance. So once we uh, have, have reconnoitered a little bit, we can. Um, do a what we call a leapfrog flight, where we'll we'll take off, we'll we'll fly um, over our previously scouted prospective landing site, take another navigation fix, continue flying to a prospective third site, scout it out, you know, with the lidar, with stereo imaging, um, and then come back to the second site. So we sort of take two steps forward and one step back. So after that very first landing we never need to commit to landing the vehicle at some place that the, the team on the ground hasn't scouted out and satisfied themselves is, is scientifically interesting uh, and is adequately free of, of hazards. Uh, we also have the capability to fly uh, to, to some altitude to profile the, uh, the atmosphere. Uh, and we'll do those kind of flights uh, a couple of times during the mission. Um, but these are the, the basic uh, templates for our flight operations. So the, the raison d'etre of the mission, of course, is to, to measure um, the surface composition, the organics, and look for um, biological molecules, large uh, molecules. Bi living things tend to be rather selective in how they build up chemical compounds. They use uh, building blocks that repeat. Uh, all the uh, fatty acids in uh, sheep lanolin, for example, are, uh, are even numbered uh, numbers of carbon atoms in the, in the chain. Uh, because living things uh, you know, develop these patterns. Uh, there's another property, which is that um, all the uh, amino acids uh, uh, that uh, can have um, stereoisomers that can be mirror images of each other, um, in living things, they're all left-handed. Um, the the right-handed ones just aren't used. Uh, if you find a meteorite, they sometimes have amino acids in, and there's equal numbers of the two two flavors. But living things only have one. There's this selectivity, and that's again uh, a, a chemical pattern we can look for that isn't specific, or we don't think would be specific to um, to uh, the uh, the chemistry of of life on Earth. That, that may be a, a general property of of life uh, in the universe. Um, the way we get the, the dirt into the, um, uh, the, the mass spectrometer instrument for chemical analysis is, uh, is as I say, with a drill system. It's actually a pneumatic uh, transport system. If you uh, Google uh, honeybee dragonfly drill, you can find a fun uh, YouTube video that, uh, that shows it in operation. But basically, we, we use the Titan uh, environment again. Um, the, the drill is um, uh, uh, actually somewhat hollow. Um, and uh, generates cuttings in a uh, solid material. And those cuttings are basically sucked up through a set of uh, pipes um, and, and valves to a, a carousel where the, um, the, the solid material is trapped in this little diverter cup. And that, that it then delivers, um, uh, presents the, uh, the material to the scientific instrument. So, um, you know, it's a little bit like uh, vacuum cleaner engineering, um, but it's a way of getting the sample uh, into the instrument very quickly, so it doesn't have time to warm up or otherwise be altered. Um, and it's very flexible in terms of we can select whether we're using uh, the left or the right skid 
um, and it minimizes uh, sample crosstalk. It's actually a very, very innovative and, um, and, and clever uh, system. Um, I mentioned uh, gamma ray spectrometer. Uh, when these instruments uh, fly in uh, on airless worlds like asteroids or the moon, uh, or even Mars, they exploit cosmic rays to excite uh, the gamma rays from the, the surface material. Uh, Titan's atmosphere is actually dense enough that it screens out the cosmic rays to a large extent. And so we have to sort of bring our own neutrons. Um, there's a pulse neutron generator uh, technology that's used in oil exploration down uh, down boreholes, wherein you actually um, uh, accelerate with a, a 100 kilovolt um, uh, voltage uh, tritium uh, ions into a deuterium dope target. So technically, it's a particle accelerator. Um, technically, it's also a fusion reactor. Uh, this this uh, collision um, uh, between the deuterium and trit tritium uh, causes a fusion reaction. Um, that releases a high energy neutron. And it's those neutrons that we use to interrogate the, uh, the, the surface. So it's kind of fun to say that, um, you know, Dragonfly has a fusion reactor as well as a, um, a radioisotope power source. Um, we'll have cameras, as I mentioned, uh, and these, these study at a range of scales. The, the microscopic imager will, will look at the uh, drill site to uh, look at the texture of the sand grains before we, uh, before we attempt to, to take samples. We'll learn about the geological history of the material that we are, are sampling, um, and we'll get great views from, from the air, of course. There'll be those sort of airplane window uh, vistas of, of Titan's varied uh, landscape. Um, we can use uh, light emitting diodes to provide structured lighting um, and in particular use uh, near infrared colors that are uh, uh, diagnostic of, of composition. This is a sort of false color of some Titan analog material. Um, we can also use an ultraviolet um, light source to excite fluorescence. A lot of uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, such as those we think are on Titan, um, fluoresce. You know, they, they release optical light when stimulated by, by UV. And so it might be that you know, Titan sand dunes glow in the dark. Um, we'll, we'll find out by, um, by using our, uh, our, our black light on it. Um, I lead a, a meteorological and geophysical investigation. Um, basically, we measure the, the wind, the methane humidity, the pressure, temperature. Um, we measure some properties of the, uh, of the ground. Uh, and we uh, probe the, the deep interior of, of Titan, and in particular, um, gauge the uh, thickness of its ice crust, which we think overlies a liquid water uh, interior, um, by looking for seismic waves, you know, just the way InSight is doing at, at Mars right now. Uh, and actually the seismometer, which you know, has to operate at 94 Kelvin, uh, is uh, a contribution from, uh, from, from JAXA, from our Japanese colleagues. Uh, so that's gonna be a very exciting uh, aspect to the, the mission. And, and a lot of that seismic observation happens when the lander is hibernating you know, during the, uh, the nighttime when everything else is, uh, is switched off and nice and quiet. So uh, our target is uh, an impact structure called, called SELC. Uh, impact craters tend to be rather rugged, so we don't go there first. Uh, we are actually targeting uh, a dune field um, about 100 kilometers to the south of Selk. So we'll land in terrain that we think looks like these dunes uh, in, in Egypt, where there's nice flat interdune areas and shallow dune plinths, so plenty of safe spots to land. Once we ha have made that first landing, then of course we'll have so much more information to, to plan the geologic traverse and um, you know, manage our, our progressive exploration towards the crater. You know, what we're really after, as indicated by, um, by these Cassini data, this blue stuff, is um, material that we think may have melted, you know, crustal ice that has melted in the impact event and become liquid water. And that liquid water interacted with the, you know, the brown organics that make the dunes and, and maybe has produced that really interesting um, chemical steps that, uh, that I discussed earlier. So we're, um, we're hard at work um, you know, making this real. Uh, we uh, commissioned last year a, a test chamber at APL that um, not only replicates the temperatures of Titan, but also gets you that super pressure, the one and a half bar. Um, this is a test of the, the sampling system to, to see that the, um, you know, the gas flows and particle transport work, uh, work well at the uh, relevant uh, Reynolds number. Um, we're doing a lot of uh, equipment uh, qualification and um, uh, TRL, um, you know, technical readiness uh, maturation as we're in uh, phase B of the project. Um, we have lots of um, you know, simulations of the, the rotor flight. There are uh, some interesting interactions 
uh, with a, a, an X8 layout where in, in forward flight, the, uh, you know, the rear rotors are in the downwash from the, the forward rotors. And so just understanding the performance uh, and vibration implications of those kind of interactions is, uh, is important. Um, you know, the simulations also let us see, you know, where, where the most draggy elements on the uh, vehicle are. So, you know, which air elements will benefit from uh, aerodynamic contouring, you know, from putting kitting around to uh, improve the streamlining. Of course, you don't want to rely completely on CFD, uh, especially for the, the rotor interactions. Um, and, you know, in fact, Dragonfly's development now has been longer under COVID conditions than it was before the pandemic hit. And so we've had various challenges to, uh, to deal with like, uh, like NASA facility access. We had to get uh, special uh, permission to, to use the uh, 14 by 22 foot uh, tunnel at, uh, at NASA Langley for um, some, some rotor tests. But um, you know, these sort of challenges come your way. And um, you know, one of the great things about outer solar system exploration where you're looking forward with a 15 year horizon is that you know, a pandemic is, is just a bump, you know, whether it's out of the way in one year or two years, it's just a bump. We, we have something big and exciting to look forward to you know, 15 years from now. Um, great, the great virtue of a, a, a multi-rotor vehicle, unlike a rocket-powered vehicle, is you can do a lot of testing on Earth. Um, we have a, a scale, um, a half-scale vehicle um, that uh, we fly routinely at a farm near near APL, uh, and in fact, we we just took it down to uh, Yuma to uh, fly in the uh, Imperial sand dunes, uh, which have a more more representative surface texture. Uh, for our navigation system to, to lock onto. Um, this box here, we call the drone box, houses the, the navigation cameras and, uh, uh, and IMUs and so on. Um, so there's a lot going on. Um, uh, NASA uh, recently indicated that they would provide us a, uh, a launch vehicle with the capability to actually get us uh, to Titan um, with a 2027 launch and arrival by, by 2034. So you know, same season as, uh, as, as Huygens. Um, we'll do one Earth flyby and a deep space maneuver, uh, and then the entry and descent, as I as I described. So, you know, 2027 will probably come quicker quicker than than any of us realize. Uh, there's a lot uh, of, of of challenging development to do between now and then, but a, a lot of really fascinating um, uh, things to, to to figure out. Uh, so again. Um, you know, you can read about uh, some of this in, in my books and uh, you know, we have a great website with a lot of resources about uh, the mission. So I'm, uh, I'm happy to take some questions. Um, uh, thank you for coming. Yeah, this is so exciting. Uh, this is really, uh, I immediately have multiple questions, but I want to uh, give the opportunity to the uh, audience. I think, uh, uh, so folks, you're welcome to um, please, you know, click raise hand, you have more direct interactive ways uh, to engage with the speaker. Um, first, I think Mr. Robert Fiske uh, has a question, but I think it's better you speak out. So yeah. uh, go ahead, Robert, go ahead, speak out your question. Can oh. you use it? Yeah, um, can you hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so you mentioned copper wires and then you also mentioned the uh, the extreme uh, cold temperatures on Titan, and I don't. I was wondering whether they're cold enough to uh, support uh, superconductors instead of copper. That's a that's a really interesting idea. I don't think uh, I don't think we'd thought of that. I mean, there are uh, indeed what you know what they call high temperature superconductors that um, that do function in, in at liquid nitrogen temperatures of you know seventy seven K. Um, probably there are some that that would operate at ninety four. Um, that that presents a, a testing challenge. Right, you, you, the, and um, there's there's part of the cabling that is inside the the warm body of the lander, and there's part that's outside, and so you know the, the stuff that's superconducting outside won't be superconducting all the way. So then you have to have some copper going part way. Um, so I, I think it would it would raise some some challenges. It would be also harder to to test on Earth. Um, but that's a, that's a really interesting thought. There, there might, you know, in, in some, some layouts be some advantage to something like that, but I, I think it would be, be more complicated than it would be worth. Thank you. Um, yeah, there was a question, I think, uh, wondering if the slides would be available. Um, I don't think we're making the slides available. If there's something you, you need specifically, um, you know, drop me a line. I'm easy to find on, on Google. Um, yeah, let me leave it at that. 
but I think George has a comment or question. So George, go ahead. Okay, I wasn't actually planning to speak, but um, I'm outside. But uh, thank you for the great presentation. I was curious about uh, given the rapid advance in recently, in particular camera technology, whether you have um, sort of a, a window of time to continue advancing your camera selections, or if you have to, to sort of draw a line in the sand already and say, this is what we've got to work with and, and we can't go any further. And then a related question about uh, memory technology. Um, since obviously you want to store as much as you can, um, you know, do you have a limitation on, on that factor with space rated chips? Yeah, great, uh, great question. So um, the, 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 the big picture, of course, is that, that space is a surprisingly conservative business. And especially in a competitive mission selection as New Frontiers, um, great store is set by, by heritage, right? If something has flown before, it's been space proven. Uh, and uh, our, our camera uh, vendor choice uh, was was you know, motivated by by those sorts of considerations. So the, um, the the camera system, I think, has a you know a lot in in common with the the one flying on Osiris Rex, which is you know also from um, Microvine at uh, at Malin in, in in San Diego. Um, you know the the reality is any pictures we get from Titan are going to be amazing. Right, the the Huygens picture I showed you. Um, uh, at the beginning was a 256 by 128 pixel image that was highly, highly compressed, in fact. Um, so, you know, with the, the multi megapixel uh, imagers we, we have, even if they're not, you know, the state of the art in, in terrestrial uh, camera technology uh, will be will be amazing. Um, the uh, the light levels at Titan, it should be should be noted are are low. Right, we're ten times further from the sun than is the Earth, so the top of the atmosphere illumination is a hundred times down, and then the haze filters out uh, a lot of the blue light, some of the green light. So um, you know the the illumination at noon is about a thousand times less than noontime illumination on Earth, but that's still a thousand times brighter than full moonlight. Right, there's enough enough light to take a picture, as as Huygens showed, um, but you do need to uh, pay attention to uh, pixel size. And uh, you know the, the optical aperture uh, to keep the exposure times manageable, and that's a, a particular consideration when we're when we're flying. Um, as for memory, um, yeah, the um, actually our our uh, our requirements are that we have enough mass memory on board to basically store the entire data return from the whole mission. Now that's the you know, nominal set that you define to meet the scientific objectives that the mission was selected for. Um, you, you can always take more pictures, right? Um, but what we'll be able to do is, um, uh, despite the the, the modest uh, downlink capability compared with you know what you have at Mars with a, the less distance and the relays and so on, um, you know we'll be able to send back uh, thumbnails, right? Uh, uh, quick look products, and then we'll be able to identify what are the most interesting uh, images to to send back the the full resolution versions of. Um, and because we spend a lot of time on the ground, you know, we can do a lot of uh, onboard uh, data selection and uh, compression. And for example, you know, this um, this seismometer instrument is a good candidate for that. You know, we'll we'll, we'll look for um, signals of particular interest when you know most of the time it may may be relatively quiet. So you know, making the most of every bit uh, is is a big part of the the sort of dragonfly philosophy. Uh, let's see. I'm um, uh, Chris. Chris. Yeah. Chris. Uh, Christoph. Mandy. Mr. Mandy. Uh, hi there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. I, I just wanted to ask. You showed the day-night cycle taking advantage of um, of Titan's unique tidal locking. Um, how much can you use the uh, planet shine given the tidal locking as well? Uh, actually, not at all. So, um, as, as I said, um, you know, Titan is tidally locked. Um, so the sub-Saturn hemisphere is centered at zero longitude, which is the edge of the map in, in this presentation. So the anti-Saturn hemisphere is centered in the middle of the map here, and we're right there. So Saturn is not in our sky ever. Um, so no beautiful Saturn in the sky, no planet shine to exploit. Uh, sorry, 
I, I, I don't know if anyone's done the calculation of whether one of the moons of Saturn might be dimly visible at night through the haze. Um, that would be a, a tall order, but it's, it's maybe possible. Okay, Darius. Uh, Darius has a question. Go ahead, Darius, speak up. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Uh, I was just wondering if there's any um, particular reason not to use an orbital relay on this mission, like the Mars missions, and maybe it's, um, is it like, is there any particular reason for that, or is it just um, that it's not worth the weight savings of having a less powerful antenna on the lander itself? Uh, an orbital relay would be absolutely wonderful. However, the NASA New Frontiers program is a fixed cost program, 850 million. Um, you know, we have a lot of very capable lander um, for, for, that, for that money. There is no way you can have a second spacecraft um, in that budget envelope. It's just impossible. Um, I agree it would be great, um, but um, in the, the framework um, that NASA solicited uh, missions, um, it, it just, just isn't there. Thank you. Yeah, while we're waiting for uh, more folks to raise their hands. Oh, somebody raised their hand. Okay, Ardash, one second. Ardash, go ahead. I have to unmute. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes, hi. I was interested in knowing if there's a need for very high speed transmission of data like a video of two hours in one second uh, into on, on site. In other words, you're collecting a lot of data. And it's, I'm not talking about the one from Titan to the earth that we know, but it is for collecting the data on, the, on site. Of time. So the the cameras we have, um, you know, can can in principle take um, you know several frames a, a second, I think. Um, but there's no scientific justification for 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 doing that. Okay. Um, we have a navigation cameras again that probably take images on on a roughly one second kind of cadence to okay. to figure out exactly how fast we're flying across the terrain. Um, but um, but really, there's no no video um, uh, identified, and, and as you as you note, um, you know that would have to be processed on board because um, the the downlink to the Earth is is limited in its capacity. Um, the one thing that we do know, um, we um, can can uh, could expect to see things moving, is uh, what we call a saltation experiment. One of the um, uh, key unknowns in, in interpreting the sand dunes and what they tell us about the climate on uh, climate record on Titan is knowing the speed at which the wind speed at which sand grains start to move. And mm -hmm. we, we can actually do an active experiment on that by applying uh, different wind stress by spinning the rotors at different speed. Uh, and we actually have a, a photodiode on the skid that will, will detect the shadows of the, the, the sand grains as they get 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 moving um, we uh, while we don't have video um, we do have a microphone um, as much as a drilling diagnostic you know health mm -hmm. diagnostic as anything else but um, you know maybe we'll hear the uh, hear the wind howling or uh, you know who knows what we might hear thank you excellent uh, presentation thank you okay I, I think Dennis has a Dennis, so Dennis, go ahead. You are admitted. Uh, Dennis, you can speak up. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, yeah, I just wanted to know how much does the vehicle weigh overall? Basically the same as, uh, as Curiosity uh, or, as or, or per, per Perseverance. Um, you know, we're still in uh, phase B. I mean, we're still a year from our preliminary design review, so um, you know a lot of details are still in flux. But you know, it's it's about three quarters of a ton, probably a little more. Um, you know, we won't know until we've finished building it. It's it's not it's not a small thing, right? Um, you know, you can 
see from this uh, from this this mock up, um, you know, that it's basically as tall as a person. Um, you know, there's a big battery, right? At, you know, 15 or whatever kilowatt hour battery. Uh, the RTG is is 40 kilograms right there, and you know, the, these things add up. Oh, uh, Dennis, anything more, or that's it? Yeah, thank you. That's it. For okay. Uh, so, uh, folks, uh, please, you know, there's a great opportunity. We have the uh, the, the the expert, you know, the main expert, uh, Dr. Lawrence here. So please, you know, speak out, type in for your question. So while waiting for more questions, I do have a, a quick one. So mm -hmm. Dr. Lawrence is. Um, so you just mentioned the size of the uh, uh, the dragonfly is as big as uh, perseverance, and uh, also inside. Uh, but just curious because it's going too far away. Is it possible to carry two, you know, uh, dragonfly, and uh, you have redundancy uh, because it's further away into the solar system, or it's just too 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 big? But well, so. Um... You know, Titan is a is a big place, um, and Dragonfly is going to fly from you know here to to here. There would certainly be value, scientific value, in sending more than one Dragonfly. You know, maybe maybe send one to this this crater Menerva I showed you. Um, maybe maybe send one up to the the margins of the seas. You know, they, it would be great. But NASA said propose a mission that is $850 million. And that gives you one dragonfly. Um, if, you know, if they say propose a mission for another one or a mission for two, you know, we'd, we'd happily do it. Um, but uh, what one is what you get. So, so, you know, we have to make sure it's reliable, right? We, we do a lot of testing, a lot of um, design uh, to, to make sure that it's, um, you know, robust to, to single point failures uh, to the extent possible. Um, you know, we have two drills for that reason. Um, but, you know, um, yeah, uh, it's it's a sad fact that uh, we, we just get one for now. Yeah, I understood, you know, because you mentioned about LIDAR or those things, you know, these things are getting smaller and smaller. And actually, I was amazed if you know the iPhone 13 and the Samsung mm -hmm. Galaxy, the new phone, even on the cell phone, you have LIDAR. Of course, that's the capability, no comparison to the big ones. But I'm just saying, you know, it's possible things can be made smaller, maybe you can two smaller dragonflies, you know, something like that. But well, so, the same thing. so this the scaling, uh, scaling down doesn't work so well on Titan because, you know, the smaller you make something, the larger the surface area to volume ratio and the, the heat loss becomes significant. And, and there's, there's no scaling of the power source, right? The MMRTG is a Department of Energy NASA unit that is qualified for, you know, um, for, for space use as is right there's no half mmrtgs so you know you, 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 you scaling down the rest of the vehicle wouldn't wouldn't make any sense okay byron byron go ahead well uh he might have some issue with this yeah i can i can read the question yeah please go ahead uh, so the the question is will the vehicle establish itself uh in orbit around titan before making uh, descent to the surface, uh, and the answer is uh, is, is no. Um, we we don't need to do that. Um, uh, Titan's thick atmosphere is is such that we can basically just throw ourselves at it, and and the atmosphere does the job of removing you know that um, six kilometers, seven kilometers a second of interplanetary velocity for us without us having to use propulsion to do so. Um, you know, it's one one of the reason. Uh, one of the reasons that Dragonfly fits, that it's affordable, is because we, we perform a direct entry. You know, just as Curiosity and Perseverance made direct entries from, uh, from uh, approach to, to Mars. Okay, ju just Preet, uh, Mr. C, go ahead. Hello, uh, am I audible? Yes, hi. Uh, Good morning. Hi. Uh, I think you partly answered my question, which was uh, whether the mission uh, would look at uh, laser communications for relay, but you did mention that the scaling effect doesn't work like that. And 
So, um, you know, laser communication is uh, is an interesting I idea for, for high bandwidth um, comms. Um, one issue is is the hazy atmosphere um, that the at optical wavelengths, the, the atmosphere has a, an optical depth of about three. So there's a lot of scattering that would possibly threaten the ability of a, a laser communication system uh, from Titan surface. You know, it might, it might be a good idea from, from orbit. If you had a Titan orbiter, uh, laser communications might make some, some sense, but not from the surface. Um, you, you, you have, you know, very tight uh, pointing requirements associated with, with, um, laser communications too, but um, that's, uh, you know, in principle, a soluble problem. Um, but from, from the surface, in fact, um, you know, there's a preference in NASA uh, for, you know, frequency allocation reasons and, and uh, other aspects to, to actually move to shorter wavelength radio communication to use KA band uh, when possible on planetary missions um, that we're actually not uh, following. Uh, we, we use X band. Uh, you know, three centimeter wavelength, a, bit, a little bit longer, um, because especially when the Earth is low in the sky on Titan, there's there's enough um, atmospheric attenuation at Ka band to um, to make it um, less effective. Actually, uh, so we we use X. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I thought, uh, One more question that uh, I have regarding your lidar, uh, mm. because I worked on my that's my work on multiple scattering in very mm -hmm. dense atmospheres. And mm -hmm. there are two issues whether you've considered what is called the pulse length, as well as attenuation of uh, mm -hmm. signal to noise ratio when multiple scattering is present. If you are trying to get wind measurement, motion of the atmosphere, not the size distribution as much. So they are both, NIDA are used for both. And that's, that's my PhD work, so. Right, uh, yeah, so um, uh, first we, we uh, use the, the LIDAR only for hazard detection uh, okay. on the ground. We're not, we're not measuring, measuring the, the wind uh, with it. Um, and um, uh, indeed, uh, we have to pay attention to uh, the atmospheric properties. Now, the reason Titan is hazy is not because there's lots of haze in its atmosphere uh, per unit volume. Um, if you uh, actually do the calculation of what the meteorological definition of, of visibility is, it's something like 50 kilometers on Titan. It's actually relatively clear atmosphere. It, it only looks hazy in pictures from, from orbit because you're looking through 150 kilometers of the stuff. Um, so uh, the, the, the haze scattering um, for, for ranges of a few hundred meters that, that we're using it for is, is minimal. Um, now, you know, we have to you know, figure out what it is exactly and, and put it in the, the, the error budget and all that. Um, there is an, actually an interesting um, tweak uh, about the atmosphere, which is the methane. Um, methane, which is present at about 5% at Titan surface, um, is, is an optically active gas, right? It's a multi-atomic um, molecule. Um, and in fact, it's the, um, the near-infrared uh, absorption bands of methane that, that allowed the discovery you know, by, by telescope spectroscopy in 1944 uh, of Titan's atmosphere in the first place. Um, and there's uh, an absorption band at 889 nanometers, which is close enough to, I guess, uh, is it 905? There's a, a typical laser diode um, wavelength used in some LIDARs, that, that would mean that actually um, that wouldn't be effective for, for ranges more than a few few meters, tens of meters. Um, the 1.06 you know, neodymium YAG uh, wavelength actually is in a window between methane absorption bands. So uh, the atmosphere is, um, is, is very transparent at those wavelengths. But you're, you're right, the environment does need to be modeled um, and taken into account in the specification of, of all the bits and pieces on Dragonfly. And actually my, one of my main jobs as a engineer who became a planetary scientist and with the role uh, mission architect uh, is defining uh, these kind of environment parameters. You know, how strong are the winds? How big are the rocks? How much um, uh, acoustic absorption is there? How much optical absorption is there? How much radio absorption is there? All, all, all that is, is kind of the, the fun that I'm having right now.
Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Lawrence, did, what you mentioned is just so exciting. Um, I'm just curious, you know, this uh, NASA gave a go with, uh, to the uh, Dragonfly. Uh, is there any reason that, that you got to go, go ahead before Enceladus or, you know, other possibility? Why, why did this give a, a priority for this? One? So uh, the New Frontiers um, solicitation asked for um, missions that included uh, lunar South Polar mission, uh, maybe sample return, uh, comet sample return, uh, Enceladus, uh, Venus. Uh, and uh, there were two Enceladus proposals. And in fact, I was involved with one of them. Um, so why did we get picked? Why did Dragonfly get picked over, over those? Um, I can only assume it's the uh, balance of uh, scientific appeal um, versus real or perceived uh, technical risk. Um, there are other programmatic considerations like um, uh, you know, work balance between different centers. Um, there are factors like international participation, uh, the composition, the demographics of the team, um, the uh, interaction with other programs like the radioisotope power systems program. Um, you know, we worked very hard to put together a, a very detailed and, you know, very um, uh, attractive, you know, mission proposal. Uh, and it was very carefully scrutinized by, um, I think at the site visit, there were something like 40 or 50 um, you know, subject matter experts from NASA and, uh, and consultants, you know, asking very hard questions about every little bit of the mission to, to flush out, you know, those areas that might merit attention. I mean, the competed um, mission framework is, um, is, is brutal, right? There are lots of great ideas that would be, you know, wonderful to fly to Enceladus, to Venus, to comets, uh, you, you, you name it. And, you know, NASA gets to pick which one goes first and uh, doesn't always expose its reasons. Um, I think it's generally accepted that Dragonfly is pretty cool. If that's a metric, um, you know, I think that metric worked in our favor. Yeah, it is so cool. And also the, the book that you just showed, it was so impressive. It must be your hard work, you know, all the- I was the It was the hard yeah. work of a lot of people. Um, yeah. You know, it, it, it takes, a, it takes a, a talented team to, to put these things together. It's impressive. Now, uh, Darius has a, another question. Darius, go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if there's any uh, design considerations for the effects of uh, sand and like um, other like rocks and stuff on propellers and other uh, design parts of the vehicle. Yeah, so um, you, you run into the um, interesting questions, um, uh, some of which are planetary science ones, some of which are, are aerospace ones. Um, uh, the, the first is the, the, the planetary science thing, right? What is, is all this stuff made of? And when you look at the, you know, the lab data, cryogenic temperatures, um, uh, water ice and these organics are typically 10 times less hard than silicate rocks. So, um, you know, we, we did think about whether uh, there would be uh, erosion of, of rotor blades um, and, uh, and there isn't, we, you know, we did a lifetime test on the impeller uh, of, the, um, of the, the sampling system, right? Because, you know, it's designed to, to inhale the dirt um, and, and uh, you know, expel, expel the air, the dirt laden air um, through, this, um, through this blower. So we did a lifetime test to, to be sure that, you know, the, the tight analog material and, you know, we used actually silicate sand as a deliberate stressor uh, for for that, so so we don't think um, sand erosion per se is a is a problem. Um, there is the the question of brownout uh, when the the downwash from your rotors might kick up set, uh, dirt or or dust from the ground, and that of course was a big issue in um, helicopter operations in in Afghanistan among other other places where uh, pilots could lose uh, situational awareness and, and, and crash. Um, the situational awareness thing is less of an issue for, um, you know, uh, a system with an autopilot and a inertial guidance. Um, but we do, we do switch off the LIDAR or at least stop listening to the LIDAR uh, when we're within 10 meters of the ground um, because we, we recognize the possibility that below that altitude, the, uh, the downwash could, uh, could kick up some dust. So we've, you know, we've, we've evaluated that, that hazard. Um, and, and, you know, there's 
all kinds of what ifs you can ask about a mission like this and you know like like other um, space projects you know we have a, a disciplined uh, risk management process there's a, a risk board every two weeks and you know anyone on the project can say you know hey i think this thing could be a problem and and you know you you look at it you decide what what more information you need to assess the hazard uh, you decide what the mitigations might be you know what you can do to to make it better uh, and decide whether whether to take those mitigation steps which you know might cost you a lot of money uh, or or accept the risk right but the fact is that planetary exploration is not an enterprise that is risk free and so some risks inevitably have to be accepted um, but we we try to at least think about uh, all all these kind of considerations like the ones you uh, like the ones you mentioned with with dirt and rotors thank you Yes, also, uh, Dr. Lawrence, I noticed uh, it all throughout your presentation, you didn't quite you, you put the words, you know, uh, organics, complex organics, and a mass, mass spec, uh, mass spec, mass spec spectrometry. Uh, but you don't literally speak, uh, speak out. Uh, um, it literally speak out live, you know, like some, some other people who search for live in solar system. I think it's probably in good way to tone it down a little bit, even you have the capability of doing it. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're right. Yeah. I, 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 we we use the the word organic to imply carbon bearing, um, uh, not not specifically of of biological origin. I think that that's better. It's really better because if you keep talking about life, you know, it become a little bit, you know. Yeah, and uh, and often uh, when I give these talks, there are questions about um, planetary protection, uh, for example, that uh, you know is a quite a prominent um, uh, aspect of of mission development for uh, Europa uh, and for for Mars. You know, because Titan is so cold, um, basically any any bio burden, any any bacteria, uh, spores, whatever we have on 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 the vehicle, are are not going anywhere. They're just going to freeze to death. So we, we don't have to worry about um, sterilizing the spacecraft or, or anything like that. Um, Titan is a, an interesting place from a prebiotic chemistry standpoint, but it's not an environment where we expect there to be living things, uh, at least not life as we know it, that, because that requires liquid water and it's just too cold. Yeah, and you mentioned about your work on the uh, the Beagle and uh, Cassini Huygens, and now this. Uh, as I understand, it is uh, because the money is limited, the grant grant is limited each time. So, is there a kind of overall gradually uh, kind of picture like um, that's why you designed this mission, and then what would be the next mission you will be looking for if given uh, the budget? Oh yeah, so. Um... You know, we will do, I think, a, a very good job of um, investigating the, you know, the chemical composition of different types of material at Titan, right? We'll, we'll analyze some brown stuff and we'll hopefully analyze some blue stuff. Uh, you know, we will um, hopefully answer this question about how, how far down the chain of chemical complexity has, has the material at this site gone. But, you know, there's a whole big world to explore here. Um, you know, by means uh, that were identified in the, the flagship study uh, or some of those other missions. Um, I think a, a logical next step, uh, I mean, it would be a logical step immediately as well. That's not what, what NASA asked for, uh, would be an orbiter, right? Cassini uh, flew by Titan, you know, 120 times, but was only within, let's say, uh, 10,000 kilometers of Titan for uh, about two hours each time. So, you know, if you had a Titan orbiter in one week, it would have spent more time uh, observing Titan closely than Cassini did. Uh, and, and, you know, over years, it would, would, would send back, you know, much more high resolution information, um, you know, that would let us understand some of these landforms on, on other locations on Titan. So my, my guess is that the logical next step for Titan would be an orbiter. Um, but as I said, you could, quite legitimately propose, you know, identical Dragonfly vehicles just going to, to different parts of the surface. Or you might, um, you know, have some specialist design for the seas, like um, uh, um, 
you know, a, a boat or even a submarine uh, to explore those. Or you could send something like Dragonfly with, uh, you know, floats uh, on, its, on its skids. You know, you, you can go wild imagining the, the possibilities at Titan because it's a, an environment that, um, that basically any kind of vehicle you can imagine uh, would, would actually work, um, work successfully. Now, the, this picture is very interesting about this uh, oil, more oil than Earth, and <laughs> this is so fun, this is so interesting. So how do you think about, you know, people are fascinated with Titan instead of it. So do you think it's, uh, it's is it be really because there's a, a possibility like Mars, you know, people might be able to go there to mining, you know, drill oil or live there. So people, you, you are even talking about orbiter, you know, give me more resources there. It's, it's a, what's the possibility and chance of course people will be fascinated obviously yeah i i actually talk about uh yeah, the the possibility for human exploration uh in my um in my my book that, that came out last year uh, the owner's workshop manual um you know you could imagine um uh, uh habitats um you know anchor probably have to be anchored to the ground right if you if you think about um having a, an atmosphere uh, in a in a uh, an igloo or a dome or or whatever on Titan, right? You you'd logically have it at one and a half bar, um, so that it's the same pressure inside and out. That you don't you don't have lower pressure in, inside your habitat. Then the, the walls don't need to be load bearing. But then if you've got um, nitrogen nitrogen and oxygen at uh, a comfortable temperature for people to be walking around inside this dome, then the dome is buoyant. Right? you'd have to anchor it down to the ground to stop it floating floating off um, so there's you know there's lots of interesting possibilities for for human exploration you could imagine astronauts having having like pedal powered um, sort of uh, uh, you know hang gliders um, to, to just kind of cruise around um, you know the mobility aspects of that that would be really fun um, the fundamental remains that Titan um, you know has a, a dense atmosphere which makes it very easy to arrive at uh, from interplanetary space. Um, and it has a lot of uh, organic compounds that, that they make it scientifically interesting. And it has a lot of hydrogen bearing compounds like, like methane. Uh, and then the latter thing makes it uh, appealing as a, you know, as a refueling stop uh, in the outer solar system. So, so, you know, I think human exploration at Titan is, is quite a long way away. Um, you know, Mars has always been 20 or 30 years from now, right? Um, and so I'll say Titan exploration is 20 or 30 years after Mars, uh, whenever that turns out to be. Uh, but for sure, uh, of places for people to, to go and explore, I think Titan, um, you know, is probably just, just, you know, just after Mars. You don't have the radiation problem that you have at Europa, for example. Um, but you have this this wonderful landscape with a, an atmosphere and processes that are very familiar to us here on Earth. Yeah, you just mentioned the book. That's actually I was about to ask you about this. You mentioned the book last year. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's uh, yeah, and we would love to post the link or, uh, or the cover page. You know, oh, I can. Cover. I could probably <laughs> find find the Amazon link and post it in the chat. Okay. 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 Uh, okay. Yeah, because so uh, we'll post in our newsletter, more people can see it. Also, oh, is it just last year? Wow, that's amazing. Uh, yeah. So how do, how do you think from a scientist engineer and uh, now you're writing this, uh, uh, you know, for the public things, how, how do you feel? You know, you, you, uh, which side you enjoy more? Right? I, I think I found that um, the, um, the organizations that engineers work in um, are are less suited to me, you know, psychologically. Um, that that the sort of whole chain of command thing. Um, uh, I I I would I mean I find it very frustrating if somebody tells me to stop working on something, right? And that's that's what often happens to engineers is you know some project comes to a, a logical end or an illogical end and and you you move on to the next thing and and the character of of engineering organizations is that that's just that's just the way it goes whereas scientifically um people tend to kind of grapple onto um um uh subject matter uh, or 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 techniques that they sort of make their own they, they acquire some sort of intellectual ownership of or sen sense of ownership of and that's a lot more like the territoriality of of cats 
uh, rather than the, the pack behavior of, uh, of dogs. And, and so I think um, while I've, uh, I think, made a, a good career out of kind of hopscotching the, the boundary uh, between the two disciplines and translating uh, between the two, um, I, I think probably I'm closer to, uh, to being a scientist. Um, yeah, it's very important, you know, to write things in the in a people's public can understand, you know, these that that's very important uh, test. Well, I think, um, yeah, a, a big surprise in a way, um, learning, um, you know, how space missions work and so on. Uh, you know, you you in 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 school or or whatever you you learn how to solve the equations or do the experiments, um, uh, but often that's not the hard part. Right. If you if you have the basic technical ability and you apply yourself, uh, then um, you know eventually you can sort of solve the problems. The hard part, the what is often the really difficult part, is you know persuading all the idiots out there that that your experiment is the right one or that your proposed technical solution is is optimal. And and the communication skills, uh, whether oral communication or, or written, are are absolutely vital. And, um, uh, and, and, you know, not all scientists and engineers, um, you know, have those. Um, you know, the communication is, is such an important part of, of, of working on big projects, right? I mean, it's one thing to do some little test tube experiment in your basement and, you know, be Isaac Newton and closeted away uh, from, the, from the plague and, and just write your ideas down. Um, you know, to make something like a space mission happen. You know, there are hundreds and hundreds of people involved. And so communicating the vision uh, to, to a broader group, understanding their problems and helping, um, you know, to identify the, um, you know, the resources or the techniques or the people to, to solve them is, is a big part of it. And, and those communication skills are, you know, essential and, and maybe not given the prominence they deserve in, in uh, scientific and engineering education. This is so inspiring, you know, not just engineering, science, but also this, uh, uh, the books, you know, and uh, your, your thoughts, philosophy, that are all very inspiring, <laughs> yeah, really fun. And I uh, wish we can, you know, uh, you know, soon uh, invite you here, back here, and uh, we do book signing, you know, you can do the book signing. Oh, love okay. to. Yeah, uh, that would be fantastic. Let me, um, let me also post in the chat the, the link to that um, yeah. Aerospace America. Um, that's right. Yeah, that's article. right. I was about to ask you that. Yeah, it was kind of, kind of fun to put together. Yeah, actually, I was about to ask because it already posted. Is it possible we can repost it in, in our newsletter? Do you get any copyright issue? Uh, that's between you and Aerospace America, I suspect. Okay. I, I um, they, they already posted, so should it be? Should, should, yeah, should I mean, it's, it's online. So um, okay. yeah, certainly there's no issue with posting the link. Yeah, sure. I understand. Wow, this is so amazing. I was thinking about this. I was about to ask you. <laughs> you read my mind right away. This is right. amazing. Thank you so much. Um, if there's no more questions, so uh, um, somebody raised hand. Oh no, I think it's Darius already spoke. Uh, so okay. So, uh, oh, he raised hand again. So you're right. So Darius, go ahead. Um, hello. One, um, I was wondering if a hybrid design of a hot air balloon and a drone had been considered that could take advantage of both the like lower flight uh, energy requirements of a hot air balloon and the higher maneuverability of a drone. Has that been considered? Um, I, I think I looked at that once. So um, back in 2002, 2003, I published a paper in um, Journal of Spacecraft and Rockets. Uh, no, sorry, Journal of Aircraft. Um, looking at empirically the flight power for airships, you know, but at, the, at the time airships were um, thought about as, as a good platform for Titan. And the, the challenge is figuring out how much wind you need to fight against and how much power that costs you. And there's, there's basically, um, you know, to kind of, let's call it two empirical curves for um, mass and speed, right? The bigger something is, then the, the more power you have to spend fighting gravity. Um, so more, the most massive things, you know, like the Hindenburg um, are logically lighter than air platforms. Um, whereas um, pushing a big object like a blimp through the air uh, becomes progressively more and more energy expensive 
um, you know, the, the bigger it gets. So if you want to go fast, you go heavier than air. If you want to, to, to be heavy, you go um, lighter than air. And, and you know, there is this um, boundary in between. Where a hybrid fits in those um, is going to depend. But with a hybrid, you, you have the extra challenges of, of the complexity of the hybrid platform and, and the ability to test it. Um, and uh, a hybrid platform will still be more susceptible to things like wind gusts than a heavier than air platform. So a heavier than air platform is, is, just, um, is just safer, right? We land, once we land, we know we're on the ground and we're gonna sit there. Um, and then when we want to fly, then we'll take off and fly. If you have a lighter than air system or a hybrid system, you know, there's, there's this big object that's got a lot of drag area that if there's a wind gust, you know, maybe it's not going to be so securely held to the ground um, and maybe it could get damaged. So I, I think that would be the challenge is actually addressing, um, you know, the, the very formidable uh, risk aversion um, in the space business. Um, but, um, it would be an interesting study, I think, to do to, to see where in the parameter space uh, a hybrid might uh, might make sense. Thank you. And actually, well, that's the next next uh, talk of yours. That's uh, you know the people are talking about uh, balloons for Venus, mm. <laughs> right? Yeah. The vamp, uh, all kind of stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting possibilities there. That's a, that's a great point. Obviously, there are so many more questions. I have tons of them, but I know this uh, don't want to drag you too long. And actually, it's uh, give it something for the next talk. You know, when you come right. here, yeah. So yeah, say, more, save some up. Save for, something for, for up. Next time. Yeah, you are so so knowledgeable, versatile. That's, you know, you know, engineering, spacecraft, aircraft. It's it's, it's I just do the stuff that's fun. Um, yeah. I'm very fortunate exactly. that I, I get to get do it for a living. So I can see um, that. Thanks, thanks for thanks for coming, and thanks yeah. for the invitation. Thank you so much. We look forward to uh, having you here uh, in Los Angeles at or Las Vegas, and uh, when everything is ready. So yeah, yeah. See you soon. Right. And uh, thank right. you so much again. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Uh, so folks, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. So have a wonderful. Uh, weekend, Saturday, and once a week. Stay tuned. Uh, next week is uh, uh, October 2nd, it's Space Policy uh, by Dr. Uh, Mary Lynn Dittemar from XM Space. So stay in touch.